We are continuing this morning uh, on our lessons around Jesus and the miracles that he performed. We've looked at the last three weeks. Uh, they all focused around uh, one central message, which is about faith. That Jesus came and performed miracles uh, with the purpose of producing faith. Uh, a lot of times in the disciples, really, as much as anybody else. Um, but last week we looked at feeding the 5,000. One of the main takeaways that we had from that was talking about how um, we need to recognize how inadequate we are and how, how powerful God is. That's a big part of faith is recognizing that we can't do everything for ourselves. And the power that God has, um, we need to look to God for help. The week before that, um, John actually told us to go to real because Jesus didn't deny it. So we learned that. <laughs> Uh, but we also looked at uh, an example after the feeding of the 5,000. We actually kind of went backwards on those lessons. Uh, we saw Jesus calming the storm and walking on water. And so we looked at in that lesson Peter's faith and how Peter had more faith than the rest of the disciples, even though we might give them, give them a hard time um, because he looked away, but we also did the same thing in our life. Um, we talked about how when we're faced with hardships, all we have to do is call out to Jesus, just as Peter did. Um, it takes that step of faith. And then the week before that, we looked at Jairus when his daughter was sick, when she was dying. Um, Jairus came to Jesus asking for help. And what was it that happened to Jesus on his way to Jairus' house? He was interrupted by uh, somebody else that was uh, sick or some disease, a woman who had been bleeding for years. And so in this story, we talked about um, Jesus never being too busy for interruption. Um, nobody's less important than anybody else. Um, we talked about the difference, the stark difference between the woman and the man. Jairus was um, a leader. He was a Pharisee, I believe. Was he a Pharisee? Is that right? It was three weeks ago. Probably. Um, and then this woman was uh, not somebody that was high on social status. She was somebody who uh, had to stay away from people because she was unclean. And Jesus helped both of them the same. He didn't show any favoritism. So that's, that's one of the two main points we're going to look at in today's lesson, uh, talking about Jesus being fair to everyone, not showing favoritism. So moving into today's lesson, I want to start off asking you a question. Who in here has road rage? Does anybody have road rage? Yes. Jody? <laughs> Who is? Jody? Everybody? Um, so luckily, oh, what did you say? Somebody. Oh. Um, luckily, that's not something that I have, but even though I don't have road rage, I think all of us still have similar thoughts when we're driving, probably. Um, what do we think about the person in front of us who's going too slow? They need to speed up. We can call them a jerk or idiot. They need to hurry up, right? And pick your choice word, whatever you want to call them. Get out of the way. Get out of the way. Um, but what about that car or that motorcycle that comes up on our tail and wants to pass us? What are they? They're <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> They're crazy. They're lunatic, right? They're, they're a jerk too, right? Um, so our, our standard, we look at ourselves, right? We're perfect. We're the perfect drivers. Anybody that's going too slow in front of us, they're, they're crazy. Anybody that's going too fast is just driving too fast. Hey, Corey. My, my dad was coming out nature one day, and this man slowed in front of him. He kept saying, Grandpa, come on, speed up. <laughs> Grandpa, speed it up. So we, we've all had those thoughts, right? Jesus. So I think it's human nature for us uh, to kind of justify ourselves and condemn others who are different from us. And that's something we're going to look at today. I think we're all prone to judge others based on our outward characteristics that we see rather than accepting them as individuals who are equal with us but different personalities. And so we'll come back to this topic. Uh, moving into the lesson, I'll start out looking at Leviticus chapter 13. chapter 13, starting in verse 38. It says, When a man or woman has white spots on the skin, the priest is to examine him. And if the spots are dull white, it is harmless. It is a harmless rash that is broken out on the skin. That person is clean. When a man has lost his hair and is bald, he is clean. Amen, Mark? <laughs> Uh, if, he has, if he has lost his hair from the front of his scalp and his bald forehead, he is clean. 
But if he has red and black sore on his bald head or forehead, it is an infectious disease breaking out on his head or forehead. The priest is to examine him, and if the swollen sore, the swollen sore on his head or forehead is red and black like an infectious disease, the man is diseased and is unclean. The priest shall pronounce him unclean because of the sore on his head. The person with such an infectious disease must wear torn clothes, let his hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of his face, and cry out, "Unclean, unclean!" As long as he is, as long as he is, has the infection, and he remains unclean, he must live alone. He must live outside of the camp. And so I turn to this. I start out with this. This is the law um, that the people back in Jesus' time um, were looking for. This is the law they lived by. And so as we start out in today's lesson, this is going to be pertinent um, to what we're looking at. So we'll start out in Matthew chapter 8. Sorry, Mark, you're the first one I saw. <laughs> Matthew chapter 8, verses 2 through 4. It says, A man with leprosy came out and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus reached out his hand and he touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cured of his leprosy. And th then Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer a gift, offer the gift Moses commanded, as a testimony to them. So the first passage in our lesson today is a lot like the one we've looked at over the past three weeks. And the first passage, you know, at, at first glance, is really about faith. This man that had um, leprosy, that had a disease of the skin, um, who, as we read before, under the law of Moses, was considered unclean. He had to stay away from people, live, live alone. Um, if he approached people, he had to scream out, unclean, unclean. So he was really just an outcast of society. And he had faith coming to Jesus that Jesus had the power to heal him. Um, but what did Jesus tell this man after he was healed, as we've seen kind of in some other places? <coughs> don't tell anybody. Why do you tell him don't tell anybody? Well, there were so many of them. That's one of the things our book talks about is um, he doesn't want the word to get out that all he's doing is going around healing people because he's going to be bombarded by people. Is that what you're going to say? Okay. Anybody else? Any thoughts? So after he told the man, don't tell anybody, what else did he say to him? <coughs> so yeah, we just we read that in Leviticus, and so he told the man, let's go, go to the priest. Um, and there's actually another passage in Leviticus chapter 14 on what the priest could do if the man was uh, was clean. There was uh, ceremonial cleansing. But what was the priest's role when it came to lepers? Le lepers. And they weren't the doctor, right? They didn't, they didn't have the power to heal or perform uh, miracles or anything like that. They were simply the, the ones who diagnosed whether the person was clean or unclean. That was the role that they had. Um, and their job, if, if they determined that somebody had been cured, that was skin disease. Um, as we read in Leviticus chapter 14, the priest would go through a series of things for ceremonial cleansing. And I'm not going to read through that, but it involved birds and sheep, um, and sacrifices over the course of a week, and then finally ending up on the eighth day with one more thing. Um, but if we look at this passage today, what was the purpose of Jesus sending the leper back to the priest? Fulfill the law. Anybody else? I, I just don't believe I could have kept that same. Acknowledging the law. Jesus didn't come uh, to defy the law. He came to fulfill the law. 
Um, he didn't come to do away with it uh, entirely at that point. So one of the questions I had is, uh, at this point, do you think the priest that uh, this, this sick man went to, do you think that that priest acknowledged Jesus as the Son of God, as the Messiah, the Chosen One? We don't know that, but likely not, right? You know, a lot of religious leaders at the time um, did not see Jesus as who he was. I wonder how often in proportion to the ones that were being unclean did they get to pronounce somebody according to him. I have no, no way of, of knowing that. It was a true leprosy or a... Yeah, maybe they had lifelong, lifelong diseases and maybe things such as chicken pox or something like that. So, if the priest didn't think that Jesus was the Messiah, um, when Jesus tells the leper not to tell anybody, it's coupled with that command to go tell the priest. And so part of that, um, what I, I believe the main reason Jesus told the man not to tell anybody is because he didn't want people knowing that Jesus is the one that made him clean. Um, part of what he was doing was saying, go let the priest verify it. Let the priest consider you clean. Go through that period of ceremonial cleansing. Um, and that way the priest will testify to the man's cleanliness without knowing how he became clean. And so Jesus didn't want to give him an, a reason and an incorrect diagnosis. If he had a, a bias against Jesus, he didn't think Jesus was who he said he was. He didn't want that priest saying, oh no, you're not clean, you, you know, you've got temporary healing or something like that. So by the priest declaring this man clean, what we see is the law of Moses testifying to the power of Jesus. See the law pointing to Jesus as we see in several other examples. This was a lesson to the priests as well as everyone else. They were they were unaware of what was going to happen. That's right. But they, they had to confirm it, and that was convincing to them just like it was everybody that was acquainted. And that was a very thing for him to say because they couldn't call him a self right. That was one of the main things that makes it proof, proof that being the truth. why Jesus didn't want him to tell him first. He wanted the, the priest to go through the process, right? He wanted him to see this man truly is completely healed of the disease that he had. But it makes you wonder if afterwards did the priest find out how, how he was healed? Probably so, right? The priest probably found out later through word of mouth from somebody else that it was Jesus, the man that was going around uh, claiming to be the son of God uh, who was the man that healed, healed this man. So we're going to move on to our next uh, example, our next scripture. Unless anybody has anything else to I'm going to flip over to Luke chapter 17. It's verses 11 through 19. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten, man, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were clean, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself.
himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And then he said to them, Rise to him, rise, and your faith is rise and go, your faith has made you well. So the lesson in our book goes into detail talking about, uh, starting at the beginning of the passage, talking about the customary route from Galilee to Jerusalem. And it talks about the customary, customary route, a big part of the route is to avoid the Samaritans. And so they don't have to go past those Samaritans that they wanted nothing to do with, because they were despised by the Jews. And so that's the route probably that Jesus took, maybe not for the same reason, but because it was the customary route. And so after Jesus gets off the boat, and he starts heading into the village, he hears a group of people shouting at him. They're, they're begging him, basically, to heal them from their disease. Uh, out of respect for Jesus, and as part of the instruction from the law, as we read earlier, they stayed away so that they wouldn't infect anybody else that was with him uh, in case Jesus decided not to kill them. So we see in this story, is a little Samaritan man, before he came back to Jesus, probably had made it to the priest. Um, he'd probably gone through the ceremonial cleansing. So it's been a matter of at least a week, probably eight, nine days, since Jesus healed this man. Um, this is another one of those passages where, you know, from one verse to the next, we have to recognize the time that takes place between those uh, that I'm usually so bad about doing. And so it's a matter of probably a little over a week, and this man returns to Jesus. This miracle, again, like, like the rest of them, has faith as kind of one of the underlying factors, but it also brings forth a couple of new points um, that are pointed out in this miracle. The first one, when we see the man coming back, um, is those who receive God's blessing do well when they offer him praise and thanksgiving. So I think this is something that we have to make a conscious, conscious effort to do. Um, I know we say a lot of prayers of praise and thanksgiving. Um, we're thankful for the things that are really big in our lives, uh, things that are really, really obvious. But a lot of times we pray for healing for other people and we don't come back to God and thank Him for the healing that He's given. 
Uh, we're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. It says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And so that scripture doesn't tell us to give thanks for all circumstances. Um, it just tells us to give thanks in all circumstances. Um, we are supposed to be thankful only when things are going our way. We're supposed to be thankful for everything that God blesses us with throughout our lives. Um, not just, we don't have to be thankful for bad things that happen to us, but it's during those rough times that it's probably the most important for us to come back to God and recognize the blessings that He's given us um, and be thankful for those. Second thing we look at in this uh, this lesson is what I hinted at earlier. Um, the point is that noble hearts and godly ways may be found among those who suffer from prejudice and rejection. And so at the beginning of the class, I gave the example of road rage, and all of us kind of have that thought about who the person in front of us or behind us is going slower or faster. Um, but I'm the one that's driving the perfect speed because I'm perfect, right? It doesn't matter whether it's the speed limit or less or more, whatever speed I'm the one right. So I think we're all prone to prejudice. Um, what we often forget to think about when we have road rage is maybe that person in front of me on Betsy Pack Drive, it's going 30 miles an hour, which is actually the speed limit, um, is an elderly gentleman headed to church or to a doctor's appointment. Uh, and maybe what I should be doing is uh, stopping and, and being thankful, going back to our last point, that this man has the ability and the capability to get out and drive on his own, um, that he's willing to do that and not just rely on somebody else. That person could also be my Uncle George, who isn't an elderly gentleman, but he drives the speed limit everywhere he goes. Because it's long. <laughs> everywhere he goes, he drives the speed limit. Um, so for me, I, I would get frustrated when I get behind people like that. So when I'm headed to work in the morning, I know how long it takes me to get to work, based on how long it takes me to get to work every morning, not based on what the speed limit is of every single road on the way to work, right? Um, so if I get behind somebody that it's like my uncle, I'm going to be frustrated. I'm going to ride on his tail, right, until he gets out of my way. But then somebody comes up behind me, just wanting to go about five miles per hour faster than I am, and I just think they're the biggest jerk in the world. I can swerve over and get over them there, right? So we're all prejudiced, and we all use ourselves kind of as the point with which to judge. Um, that person riding behind me, both of us are going over the speed limit. It's, it's not a matter of uh, who's right or who's wrong.
So drinking beer was just something that Germans did. It's not something that they did uh, to get drunk, not wine. It was just something, the drink of their choice. Uh, so just to be clear, I'm not condemning or condoning any of these things. I'm uh, just using them as relevant examples uh, for our lesson. Anybody have anything else on that? Okay, is, is there any reason given that the church covered that the Jews and Pastors, Americans, they seem more compassionate, more loving, more easily to believe the, what God said than the Jews did? Is there any reason back in history that they don't despise John, do you have an answer to that? I, I, we couldn't hear it. Is there any reason that the, the Jews despise the Samaritans scripturally that we can see uh, they, over time? It's my understanding they uh, intermarried, and that's what uh, gave them the stigma that they had. There was interracial marriage, or I mean, maybe interracial is not the right word. They, but there was, they were, I guess, a, a, a mixed breed of people, if you will, and that's why they were despised. That's my understanding. During the during the like the Generation after generation of holy modeling built into them, which was common today as well. And we see that in you know, different countries today. So it's enough examples that I've got for today. I think, I think you get the point. We all have prejudices, whether we like to admit it or not. Um, we all like to judge each other based on worldly ideas or personal ideas, rather than looking at people through uh, the eyes of Scripture. So in both of the examples today that we read, we looked at Jesus showed 
um, showed us that we have to be careful not to judge others based on our predefined prejudices. prejudices. Um, while he was here on this earth, it was a common belief during that time that those with leprosy or those with other diseases had done something wrong to cause them to be that way. Um, so when Jesus came and he showed compassion to these people and he killed these people, uh, he kind of helped confirm that no, he didn't do this because he felt something he did. He's just different than you are physically. He's still, um, still just as capable of receiving my love and my grace. In the, in the second example that we look at, um, we see Jesus speaking highly of what he calls a foreigner, a Samaritan. And because this man's come back to thank him and praise him, uh, which is something, you know, speaking highly of a foreigner isn't something typically that you would do. Uh, so Jesus kind of shows us through his actions how we should act. We have a similar example if we look at Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Um, you know, Peter and the disciples had heard Jesus give the Great Commission time after time, yet they were still preaching, up, up until Acts chapter 10, they were still preaching the gospel mainly to who? Jews. The Jews. They weren't preaching to the Gentiles. And so in Acts chapter 10, what we see is uh, Cornelius, who was said to be a devout and God-fearing man, who was generous to those in need, and prayed regularly. It took a vision to both Cornelius and Peter for God to reveal to them, to, for God to make that sharing of the gospel occur. Because both of those men were subject to the prejudice of the time, that they, neither one of them would have gone and approached the other without the vision. The vision had just come to one of them. The other one still would have had that prejudice and wouldn't have anything to do with them. So we see several examples uh, in the New Testament about making sure that we are uh, careful about the prejudices that we have. So to wrap up, those the two main points uh, for the lesson, other than the underlying message of faith, is one, remember to offer thanks for, for answered prayers, for things that uh, we ask God for all the time, but we forget to come back to Him and tell Him thank you for the things that He's given us. And the second thing that we've talked about for the last several minutes, don't let worldly prejudice get in your way of sharing the gospel or sharing a fellowship with another believer. Jesus became a man, came down to earth, and He was crucified, not just for me and people that look like me and act like me and think like me. He came to the earth for everybody who was willing to come to him for salvation. Um, so we need to be careful as we deal with other people in the world, um, sharing the gospel and, and both the believers. Anybody else have anything before we close? Books, would you get her close? Close to prayer. Lord, we're thankful for this time that we've had.